We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Kia ora. Good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to the Change Makers, the series. This is the fifth in a series of six uh, lectures presented by members of the Lincoln Professoriate. My name's John Hampton. I'm Professor of Seed Technology at the Bioprotection Research Centre, and it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker and also to chair this uh, session. And um, now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Richard Falloon. Um, Richard is one of New Zealand's most eminent plant pathologists. Um, he's Professor of Plant Pathology at Lincoln University and also a senior scientist with plant and food research. Richard is a very uh, proud member of the Lincoln alumni, having graduated with a Bachelor of Agricultural Science and then a Master of Agricultural Science in Agricultural micro Microbiology. Uh, he then uh, went to the UK to Aberystwyth and did his PhD in Plant Pathology. And on his return to New Zealand, both in Palmerston North and here at Lincoln, he has been involved in solving problems with disease, plant diseases in, in pasture species, in forages uh, and in vegetable uh, crops. Um, Richard has an international reputation. He has held many uh, distinguished positions in the world of plant pathology. He has been the president of the New Zealand Plant Protection Society, president of the International Society for Plant Pathology, and president of the Australasian Plant Pathology Society. Um, he spent some time in Korea where he was an honorary scientist with the Rural Development Administration of the Republic of Korea. He is a fellow of the New Zealand Institute of Agriculture and Horticultural Science. He's currently co-editor-in-chief of Phytopathologica Mediterranean. It's a mouthful. Um, he's elected a fellow of the Australasian Plant Pathology Society a uh, fellow of the International Society for Plant Pathology and a life member of the New Zealand Plant Protection Society. And in 2012, he was uh, awarded Scientist of the Year by the Potatoes New Zealand Charitable Trust. And that's the cue to ask Richard to speak to us tonight about his work with potatoes, what's eating all our spuds. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Thank you, John. Um, it's a pleasure to be introduced by this man. Um, John was slightly younger than me. I came through Lincoln University, agricultural microbiology. We were sort of students together, and we've been, as John said, involved with plant pathology ever since, and latterly together in the bioprotection centre at, at Lincoln University. I want to start with an, my acknowledgement slide, and this is quite a busy slide, and I don't apologize for that, because over a number of years, I've worked with many people, and I think there are, in the top paragraph, 19 or 20 names. I won't read them all out, but all of those people I've c worked very closely with over a number of years. Probably in a more summarized way, the next line uh, puts forward the plant pathology and other soil, soil science and the disciplines that these people have been involved with and there's a reasonably long list there. Megan G has helped me prepare this uh, presentation this evening. I also acknowledge Heartland um, Potato Chips. Um, Roland Bowen is in the, in the audience and when you ask, ask the question, who is eating all our potatoes? I think all you guys have already had a go at eating them already. Um, 
I should also mention the funding agencies that have supported the research that I've done and, and, and our, our, our groups have done over a large number of years, and that's again a long list of funding agencies. This is a, a summary of the outline that I'm, of, I'm going to present this evening, and I'll cover these six topics as we go through. Well, first of all, what's eating all our potatoes, and I've already alluded to that. Um, most of the potatoes in the world, in fact, almost all of the potatoes in the world are eaten by human beings. And I just at the beginning of my presentation focus on that side of, of the um, value chain, if you like. Um, this is what we see in the supermarkets, and um, this is an important, a very important part of the way potatoes are consumed. This is the other view that we have of prepared foods, particularly, of course, these days, millions of tons of potatoes go into, into French fries, and some of them, Roland Bowen knows all about that, go into crisps, but then, of course, they're a very important part of many diets throughout the world. This is just a, quite an old graphic. You can see it only goes to 2007, but this is a graph um, representing the world production of potatoes, and it's been steadily increasing, and it's carried on since this time in a similar way. Um, in the developed world, production of potatoes is actually decreasing slightly, but in the developing world, it is rapidly increasing, and that's the reason why this is going up. And most of that increase is in the Asian area. Um, the annual production of potatoes, and this is sort of mind-boggling, it's close to 400 megatons, million tons of potatoes each year. This is just uh, a list of the uh, world major food crops, and potatoes is number four, quite a, a distant fourth be behind the um, grain crops, but you can see these are the um, million tons of production uh, per, per year, and that's the figure it's, which is now around about 400 million. This is an interesting column. This is a yield per hectare of these crops. And you can see the grain crops are quite low in their productivity per hectare. Cassava's quite high, but there's nothing quite like potatoes. And that's, a very, that's the world average production of potatoes, and in, in New Zealand terms, it's very low. The New Zealand average potato production is currently close to 50 tonnes per hectare. Um, the majority of potatoes, the biggest product, potato production is from China. And that's happened in the last 30 years as the Chinese diets have changed, but also the Chinese government has realised that it's an important food source for that, that population. And of course, New Zealand pales into insignificance beside China. Our annual production is half a million tons. I just put this graphic before you because this is from um, potato um, utilization in the United States, possibly the most developed country in the world. And you can see, you can see that almost all the um, production of potatoes is consumed by humans. There's the seed potato sector, about 7% of the um, USA consumption. There's a very small slot there of less than 1%, which is fed to livestock. All the rest of potatoes go into human food. And that's the same, it's, it's a vegetable as far as that's concerned. This is much more focused now, the New Zealand production of potatoes. And this is quite a, a dramatic change that's happened in the last few years. Back in 2000, there were close to 400 growers of potatoes producing about 450,000 tonnes on 11,000, nearly 12,000 hectares of, of fields. And the average yield was about 38 tonnes per hectare. In 2014, the numbers of grow, growers has decreased to less than half. Still producing potatoes off approximately the same amount of area. Uh, this fluctuates year to year, but it's usually around about 11,000 hectares. The, the current production is this five to 5,000 tonnes. You can see how this um, yield per hectare has dramatically increased. This is a 33% increase in productivity from the crop. 
I just a couple of figures about um, New Zealand production of, of potatoes. It's worth about 203, just over $200 million a year and producing about $20,000 per hectare. And just for comparison, I've put kiwi fruit there. We get um, about five times as much revenue from kiwi fruit, and kiwi fruit produces 90,000 tonnes per hectare. So the horticultural crops are very productive. Um, I've put wheat there, which is considerably smaller than potatoes, and the annual production of, of wheat produces around about two and a half thousand tonnes per dollars per hectare. This is where the potatoes are grown in New Zealand, and you can see that it's very much dominated by Canterbury. A um, little bit in Otago, Southland, Hawke's Bay, getting more in Manawatu, Whanganui, Auckland, that's mainly around the Pukekohe region, the Waikato, and then Canterbury, nearly 6,000 hectares of potatoes are grown in our province. Potato production nowadays is a very capital intensive operation. This is just um, a series of photographs that Sarah Sinton um, gave me. This is the sort of th activities that happen on potato crops, and this is by no means all of them, um, starting from bed preparation, um, deep cultivation to get rid of compaction layers, and I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, and you can see that it's a very highly capital intensive um, operation, very specialised equipment. This is a potato planter. Um, obviously the crops are sprayed quite often during the growing season. This is the harvesting operation, a, a specialised machine for harvesting and a lot of machinery. So it's a, it, and that, that is one of the reasons that we're working on um, soil borne diseases of potatoes at the moment as I'll explain in a, few, in a few moments. Just very briefly I want to say something about the potato plant. And this is a, a botanical drawing here of a potato plant, and mostly we see this thing when we, th when we see the crops, the, the uh, lush um, vegetation above the ground. But of course, a very important part of the plant, of course this is important for photosynthesis and, and production of um, photosynthates that, that make the potatoes. But below the ground we very rarely see that part of what's happening until the potatoes are harvested. And very much the the focus of what I'm going to say from now on is below the soil level. And this is the, the area that we've been doing research on for a number of years. Right then, let's just be plant pathologists for a moment and talk about soil borne diseases of potatoes. And you can see these sorts of things in harvested potatoes that severe problems with the quality of the tubers. And these are just examples of three tuber diseases, and I must say that they're quite severe examples of them. They're typical plant pathologists' photographs. But it's very obvious that potatoes like this are not very good in packets like that. And when in a supermarket sale, mostly now potatoes are washed for um, presentation. And if, if the soil's removed and they've got lesions on like that, those potatoes are virtually useless. I would say that if you see potatoes on the, on the shelf in the supermarket with soil on them, if you take them home and wash them, there's a good chance they've got lesions from soil borne diseases. Not always, but quite often the soiled potatoes have uh, disease problems. This is just another example of a soil borne disease. This is called verticillium wilt or early dying. This is a disease that attacks the underground parts of the plants, but the plants wilt quite dramatically and die early. And this is just another example of another group of diseases that we've been working on, and I'll talk more about them later, caused by the fungus Rhizoctonia. This pathogen, it's, a, it, it's in the soil, but it can kill the plants. It causes these dark lesions on the stems, causes quite severe malformation of tubers, and also causes another disease called black scurf on potato tubers. Right, just focusing now on one particular disease of, several diseases, but one particular pathogen of potatoes. And this organism is, Russell Jennett's here, I think it's 25 years ago that we started working on, on this particular pathogen in earnest in, in New Zealand. 
I just take a step back. This is the tree of life, um, <laughs> I'm sure some of you are aware of. And it's the, the idea with this is that all organisms on, on Earth came from an, an original ancestor. And of course, that's simplifying things drastically. The tree of life is dominated by microorganisms. There is a huge variety of microorganisms in, in, that are living in, in, on the Earth at the moment. And just at this end, we put ourselves, this is where we consider as the, the highly evolved organisms, plants and animals, and of course, we are an animal, there we are, and potato is a, is a plant. Um, the, the organisms I'm going to be talking about are also down that end of the tree of life. Um, I'm, there's Rhizoctonia, which is a fungus, and Spongospora, which I'm going to talk about now, is actually classified in this system as a flagellate. It's more like an animal, and when I was at university and at high school, it would have been classed as a protozoan, or it still is classed as a protozoan, but those organisms were um, described as primitive animals. I'll explain that ag again in a minute. Right, the diseases that Spongospora causes, and this slide just shows what I, I consider are the three diseases, but we'll talk about them in a minute. Spongospora is an organism that's all over the world, wherever potatoes are grown under intensive management. It probably originated in South America, um, and that's where potato originated. Potato, it is believed, was carried to the rest of the world by the conquistadors that arrived in South America and took potatoes back to Europe. And of course, there's been, since then, expansion of potato growing all over the world and we believe they've carried this pathogen along with them, with the, with the potatoes. Now we're going to delve into a bit of biology, and I, I hope you don't all go to sleep here, but this is what spins the wheels of a plant pathologist. Um, this is obviously a potato with the disease powdery scab, and that's caused by Spongospora. And if we look at one single lesion, and that is one lesion. I've just put on these slides the magnification that, and that is the magnification that's actually on this screen. So if we multiply a single lesion by 800 times, that's what it looks like. And you can see within the lesion, there are small spherical bodies. Let's look at one of those. It looks like that. And now we've gone to 25,000 times. This is called a sporosaurus. You can see that it's made up of individual Structures, all of, many of them have got a little, little hole in them. From those little holes comes this structure. Now we're really getting magnified. This is 225,000 times. This is called a zoospore. The zoospore's got two flagella, they're called. This one, it's thought, is used to actually get out of its structure, out of each one of those. The other one is used to swim in soil moisture. In, in this moisture layers within the soil. And these structures actually infect potato plants. This is, a, again, a high mag reasonably high magnification shot. This is a single root hair, and I'll explain a bit about that in a minute. These are the, the cells of the potato roots. And you can see here and here, there are two zoospores that have insisted on that root hair. They actually fire their nuclear material through a, a little spear that penetrates the cell and injects the uh, nuclear material of the zoospore into the cell. And you can see that the pathogen is actually multiplying within the single cell, producing what's called a plasmodium. Here's a lower magnification shot of a root, a, a single root, sorry, with masses of root hairs. These are the root hairs, these structures, and you can see they're all stained with little blue stains. Those are individual zoospores being produced in the root hairs of a potato root. And you can see how the pathogen can multiply very rapidly in roots and produce many, many of these zoospores to um, cycle. That's an, another view of one of these individual root hairs at a later stage. You can see these little chambers. Each one of those has produced four zoospores, which have now escaped and are probably infecting more root cells. Now, something happens as potatoes grow. 
We don't know what. There's a suggestion there's a sexual reproduction stage here, but at a later stage in growth, this is a seed potato here. This is the plant growing. The shoots go up through the soil. These are the stolons, these are the roots, and you can see all these galls. Well, these are caused by this pathogen. And that is a, uh, they develop on the roots at a later stage, stage of, the, of the host life cycle. This is an individual gall that's got these brown structures in, which are exactly the same as these ones. Once again, uh, these things are released into the soil. They produce zoospores in the same way as this, and the, the cycle can continue. The soil becomes contaminated, and then that can infect a, a new crop. Actually, this has got, the life cycle's got two phases, the phase that occurs on tubers and the phase that occurs on the roots. And I'll just, in the next um, few slides, talk more about the root infection stages. So that's the biology. Let's go back, take a step back in, in time. And back in 1994, as I mentioned before, when this problem was uh, the powdery scab on potato tubers, particularly in the seed potato industry, was considered a, um, a severe problem. And that's when we started work in crop and food research um, on this particular disease. And in 1994, we did some field trials um, where we uh, assessed tuber disease and crop yield in response to soil applied chemicals. That's pesticides for, that would possibly um, control the disease. And we put the pesticides down the furrow before the tubers were planted and then saw how the crop produced how well the crop produced. And where we had an effective chemical, there was a reduction in the numbers of infected tubers. So the chemicals were quite effective. But we also noticed when we controlled the disease, we got an increase in yield. And that was purely due to a 28% increase in the size of the tubers. So the tubers were bigger grown when there was an effective control being applied. And that gave us an indication that the plants were actually growing more vigorously once we controlled this, this pathogen. A bit later in time, about 11 years on actually, when we started working in, in a bit more detail to try and discover why the plants were, were growing better, we did a trial that's not very realistic. Here we um, planted potatoes at one meter um, spacings and anybody that knows anything about potatoes you don't plant potatoes like that in a field but the reason was that we wanted to measure individual plant um, productivity and performance. Half of the plants in this trial were inoculated with the pathogen that was meant that we put the pathogen in the soil near the seed tuber so that when the plant grew it would hopefully become infected. And we also carefully watered the crop, and also uh, we measured several things. But this was the result in the plant yield from at the end of the experiment when the, when the tubers were harvested from these plants. And where we had no pathogen, we, we harvested close to three ki kilos of tubers per plant, and where the pathogen was present, it was only about 1.7 ki um, kilograms of tubers. So there was a 42% reduction in plant yield or tuber yield from those individual plants. And this was made up, first of all, by a reduction in the numbers of tubers each plant produced, and secondly, by a reduction in the individual tuber weight. So in this experiment, the plants were producing fewer tubers and the tubers were lighter. So we had this um, reasonably large reduction, almost halving in the, in the tuber production per plant. We also measured soil moisture. And this is a slightly old way now of, of measuring soil moisture, but this is time domain reflectometry. You poke these rods into the soil and the gizmo that is in this, it's not a black box, but it's a box, um, measures the conductivity between those two rods and converts that into a soil moisture content. And this slide summarizes the results that we got. Now I just need to explain this a bit because it's a little bit complicated. The blue line along the middle 
represents the average. So actually the average was going up and down all through the season, but it's been converted to an average for, the, for each measurement. And this measures the deviation from that average. You can see where the pathogen was present, the soil moisture content was always, or almost always, greater than the average. Where the pathogen wasn't present, it was always less. So that indicates that the plants that were growing in association with the pathogen, infected by the pathogen, were actually using less water than the plants that were healthy. Right, now we're getting into real non-field stuff. This is again in the history, in the history line. In 2011, we started using this system for measuring some factors involved in this particular um, pathogen host reaction. And we used a fairly artificial system. This is a pot, obviously. It's only got one hole in it, and that's the hole at the top. It hasn't got any holes in the bottom. And we planted plants in here. We water, watered them with nutrient solution three times a week, but we also weighed them. And by comparison with a pot without a plant, we can calculate how much water the plant is transpiring, taking up from the, um, the, the nutrient solution, the sand mix that we've got in the pot, and uh, we can measure how much each plant is using as far as water is concerned. Now we use this system for a detailed experiment which I'm just going to explain. We had eight different cultivars and we either, we either inoculated them with the pathogen, uh, or without the pathogen, sorry, we, we you know, didn't inoculate them or inoculated them. We chose the cultivars to be mostly resistant to tuber powdery scab. These three cultivars are classified as very resistant, and we'll talk about this later in my talk. These ones are moderately resistant, so six of the eight were on the resistant side of the spectrum, and two were classified as very susceptible. On their tubers, we measured a, uh, plant parameters, water use, and spongospora severity. And just looking at one of these cultivars, this is Red Rascal, a recent, reasonably recently re released cultivar from Plant and Food Research Breeding Program. This is the results. This is in water use in grams per day. And you can see when the plants were young, the blue line is the no pathogen plants. The red line here was where the, uh, the pathogen was applied. No change, no change, no change. About two weeks later, the two lines deviate. This is the result for the, for the eight cultivars. And you can see that there was red rascal that I've just shown you. All of them, more or less, followed the same pattern. Where there were, the pathogen was applied, the water use was reduced, sometimes more than others. And this indicated that where we applied the pathogen, the root function was affected. And this is just summarizing at the end of the experiment, at this point here, 56 days that the experiment is run, and this shows the difference between the uninoculated plants, the no pathogen plants, and the pathogen plants. And in every case, there was sometimes, here's a case where uh, in this particular cultivar, red rascal, without the pathogen, it was using 18 grams per day, and where the pathogen was present, that was about half, down at about nine. These were a similar sort of reduction, and these guys over here, it wasn't quite as bad. And then we counted the numbers of root galls on the roots, and this was all over the place. Remember that these cultivars are not susceptible, they're very resistant to tuber powdery scab, but they still produce masses of root galls. And here's one, it's moderately resistant, it's called Umatilla russum, not grown in New Zealand, but grown in, in the US. It produces many, many galls, 400 and something in a root system like that, it's quite a lot to count, I might say. And other moderately resistant cultivars produce very few. And this is an indication that this stage of the pathogen 
is quite different from this stage of the pathogen. The, the host is reacting differently to the different stages of the pathogen. Well then, just in summary, this pathogen adversely affects plant growth. The uh, bad effects occur both in tuber resistant and tuber susceptible cultivars. And now we believe that there are three diseases caused by this pathogen. Disrupted root, root function, root galling and tuber powdery scab. And these two stages, the root stages, are the things that affect plant growth. Obviously, the tuber stage is important for the quality of potatoes for supermarket sale, but these two stages affect how plants grow. Right now, let's talk about the, what's called the potato yield gap project. We've been working for about five years now with, um, a, in an industry initiated uh, series of projects at plant and food research. And that's the first point, it was these, the, these um, projects were initiated by potato growers in New Zealand, by the potato industry. That this was, be, was because the potato yields were becoming uh, uneconomic, average yields of about 45 to 60 tonnes per hectare are on the borderlines of economic returns for that heavy investment into machinery and storage and all that sort of thing. The potential yields, and here I'm talking about a plant growth model that's been developed at plant and food research and crop and food research prior to that, indicate that yields of greater than 90 tonnes per hectare are possible. And these growth models are based on light interception, temperature, nutrient input into the crop growth, water input and so forth. And uh, th so this shows that the actual yields that are occurring are considerably less than the model tells are the potential yields. Well, we've been working in this multi-year field evaluation project and several of the people are here in the audience this evening have been helping with this work. And um, if there are any curly questions, they might be able to answer them better than me. But we've been working um, over the last, actually, into the fifth season. I'm just presenting results from three of these, these seasons. We've looked at multiple crops, um, both processing and fresh market crops, and we've been doing detailed surveys. We've been doing this sort of thing, getting right down in, into the crops, right down into the soil, and routinely, on a regular basis, monitoring what's going on within the crops. And the idea is that we've been assessing the yield limiting factors in the potato uh, crops of, of New Zealand, literally, and I'll explain that now. In the first year, we did field surveys in the Canterbury region, the, near the Rakaia River, into South Canterbury. And we were surveying 11 crops in detail. In four of the crops, fertilizer trials were carried out. And there was a suggestion, maybe, that the fertiliser inputs into potatoes weren't uh, optimum. And th these trials actually put a standard rate of fertilisers on the, on the plots and then doubled it to see if there was an effect on yield. So the standard rate was what the farmer would have used based on his soil tests and so forth. Doubling the rate was to see whether or not that could be increased. And what really happened was there was no appreciable in increase in soil in, in sorry, in tuber yield due to this massive increase in fertilisers, which indicated the fertiliser regimes were adequate for uh, optimum production. Well, we did detailed assessments of um, plant performance and disease in the crops as well, and also measured crop yields in all 11 crops. And this was quite involved. This was a time sequence of, of 10 visits into one crop. You can see we began in October, the crop wasn't even through. I just remark here that when you're working in potato crops visiting, you get quite good at an average pace, which is around about three quarters of a metre, because you walk through potato crops a lot and it's quite physically demanding. Anyway, this is um, just 10 pictures of the same crop through that season. You can see it goes from before emergence right through crop growing really well, starting to die off, and then senescence. 
Well, in these crops, we could identify areas that were good, easily. This is, again, quite late in the crop growth, but this part of the crop is still healthy. And other areas that were obviously not so healthy. And by looking at the um, yields in detail from some of these areas, we could measure them and make an assessment of what sort of effect these, these things were having. And these are just the tubers that were harvested from plants. I think that's a single, ah, that's a single, um, that's the yield from a single plant from these areas. You can see many tubers in here and obviously very few there. Right, these are the li yield limiting factors that this first part of the survey showed. Soilborne diseases and soil compaction were, were important factors in all of those 11 crops. In some of the crops, inefficient irrigation, weed infestation, and variable plant emergence were considered also yield limiting factors. But predominantly, these two factors were we felt, felt obviously reducing crop yields. Back to rhizoctonia. Rhizoctonia stem canker, this disease here, was present in all 11 crops. And just, this is two of the crops. You can see this is a measure of the proportion of plants, stems should I say, that are, that are affected by rhizoctonia stem canker. And you see in this particular crop, which had a long-term grass history with no potatoes in its previous history. At uh, 12th of February, 75% of the stems were still healthy, a few of them were diseased, the numbers of diseased increased, but at the end of the, near the senescence of the crop, there were only a very low proportion were actually classified as dead. Many were, were diseased, but there were still some healthy. In this particular crop, which had long-term cropping history and potatoes in the previous um, five years before, it, it, in February, all of the stems were diseased, uh, and that carried right through, and then the, the stems started to die at the end of the season. Soil compaction was um, important in some of the crops. This is just a hole that was dug, and you can see in this particular field, this is the subsoil here, and there's no um, compact, compaction layer, um, the, the roots are penetrating well into the, into the soil and that's producing um, many tubers. In this particular case there's a severe plan, uh, pan at this stage and this is a heavily cropped soil where there's been a lot of machinery over maybe even hundreds of almost a hundred years um, and though the potatoes are obviously not growing so well, the, the root penetration, even the, the tubers are not planted as deep and uh, the roots don't penetrate. And Spongospora root galls were present in five of the 11 crops, and sometimes the disease was very severe. And where we looked at those individual factors and measured the fresh yield based on small plot evaluations, where there was no limiting factor, we got up towards the 90 tonne per hectare potential that's suggested by the models where Spongospora and, root com and soil compaction together, there was a reduction. Stem canker alone caused a bigger reduction. And when we had all of those three um, factors applying in particular situations, the yields were very much depressed. And this is just a summary of the yields from those 11 crops. You can see this is the actual yield. This is the potential that's shown by the model. And you can see the model said all, all of them were about 80 tonnes per hectare or, or had the potential for 80 tonnes per hectare or more. In fact, they were only yielding around about the 50 to 65 tonnes per hectare. So the yield gap applied on all those 11 crops. The next summer, we were much more focused. We only looked at three fields. We measured soil water in each um, measurements were carried out in each crop. We also vis visited them regularly um, and many times during the um, season, uh, sampling the crops and doing disease assessments and then at the end measuring yields. The f first site was actually on, on, on a Bar Hill soil south of the, the uh, Rakaia River. When I went to this institution, it was called Lincoln College in those days, Eddie Cutler and 
Archie Adams with a lecture in soil science and they said that these were the best cropping soils in the world. Not just in New Zealand, in the world. Anyway, the first crop was on a Bar Hill soil, it was a deep soil and um, very good for, for growing crops. Site two, this was down near the Rangitata river mouth and it wasn't quite so good. Um, it had shingle ridges, you can see in the background a shingle ridge there, well just a close up of the shingle ridges, so it was quite a variable site down near the coast. The soil wasn't as good, but the soil was quite badly compacted. And then site three, it was a stony soil near Pendarvis, um, an undulating field, uh, but not so bad as the shingly one. Right, this is just a measurement of Rhizoctonia stem canker in those three um, fields. You can see, let's just look at the first one. 10th of no November, no disease, slowly increasing. And this spread here is the eight different samples that we did within each crop. So in this particular crop, the overall average of severity of stem canker, which is a scale here, you know, the greater the number, the more severe is this disease. You can see that there was on average not much disease, but there was quite a big spread um, in, uh, in the plots that we were sampling. Site two, similarly not much disease early on, but then Rhizoctonia took off at the end of the season. Again, quite a big spread. And site three was very bad, quite a, a low variability between the plots and a very high severity score at the end. This is just the yield gap in each of those crops as shown by the model again. In this particular site the yield gap was 16 tonnes per hectare, 25 tonnes per hectare and in this one 36 tonnes per hectare. So this crop was 45 tonnes per hectare around about the yield gap for the um, that we've been talking about already. The three sites again, this is Spongospora root and stem galls. We'd never, or I'd never seen this symptom of Spongospora infection on, on potato plants before. Stem galling, usually the galls are in the root system, but this, these were very heavily diseased and these were in what site three. This order's not this, the logical order. Um, you can see in site one there were no Spongospora root and stem galls, in site two there were a few at the end of the season. This is again how severe the, the um, disease was on the root systems. In site three we got many galls uh, all later in the season after Christmas but very many on the, on the plants. And this is the yield from site three where we had stem canker and root galls both present. The blue line shows what the model showed the yield of the crop should be based on its um, performance and light interception and so forth. In fact, after about January, the yield that we were measuring in all these eight plots dropped off quite considerably. And in this particular field, we think that a large proportion, if not all of that yield gap was due to the soil borne pathogen. Right, the next year, well, no, this last year that's just gone. We went a bit broader, three crops in the Pukekohe region, three in the Manawatu, I don't know, was it lots, lots in Canterbury. And these were the Canterbury ones, um, mostly again around the Rakaia River and uh, down just near Timaru. And this very briefly summarises the results from la that 2015-16 survey. All 25 crops had Rhizoctonia stem canker. No matter where they were in the, in the country, 17 had severe disease, that disease. About two thirds of the crops had Spongospora root galls, 12 with severe, that's about half of them were severe. And 60% of the crops had uh, powdery scab on their tubers. Right, in summary, Spongospora root diseases reduce potato plant growth and productivity. I think we've shown that from our experimental results. Sawborne diseases are commonly severe in potato crops. These diseases are key
causes of the suboptimum potato yields in New Zealand, and I must say everywhere else in the world, and effective management is urgently required. Now here's where the story doesn't, I was going to say, get quite so good. I mean, the story's pretty bad, but effective management, things are not quite so rosy. Let's talk about that. This is uh, what growers, some growers in the world, particularly the USA, Australia, quite regularly use. A chemical called metamsodium, which is highly toxic. It's a soil fumigant. It's applied to soil, and using that product, you can virtually do this. You can kill, it kills everything in the soil. It also kills humans if you don't operate properly. In New Zealand, it has to be applied by an, uh, an approved handler, and I think there's only one approved handler, handler and that he's based in Hawke's Bay. Uh, according to the marketers of this product in New Zealand, which just happened to have their name on that label there, um, it's probably not used in, for potatoes in New Zealand, and this is based on the amount of product they sell. It's, it's used very much in the, in, not very much, but it is used in the in, in intensive horticultural industry, but not in broad acre crops like potatoes. These are the things, and it's a, lots of words, I won't go through them, but growers can do to reduce soil-borne diseases. They can do things pre-planting, they can do things at planting, they can do things during crop growth, and then there's a few things that are being investigated. I've called them new in inverted commas because some of them aren't all that new, but there's modern methods of pathogen detection in the soil. Somebody sitting here in, in the audience is actually working as a PhD student on biofumigation. Biological control is being investigated and also using um, remote sensing to identify uh, areas of severe infections in crops. But just let's focus on these two things. I've al already mentioned soil fumigation, and we'll talk about cultivar choice. And these are at opposite ends, I would say, of the sustainability spectrum. This is just a simple slide. No, it's not. I think there's an, over 100 names of different potato cultivars here. In fact, plant and food research have been assessing the susceptibility of New Zealand available cultivars to powdery scab on the tubers. And at the moment, I think the number of cultivars that have been through the system is 100 and, over 150. Uh, I, I know you can't read that, so I've just done that. And there's some cultivars that might be familiar to, to you. Here's Agria, which is commonly grown for French fries. Very, and, you know, the more red, the bigger the bar, the better it is. You know, that's very resistant. This is very susceptible to the disease. Agri is very susceptible. Kennebec is, a, is grown widely in Australia, quite susceptible. And Atlantic in the US, very Desiree, run everywhere. Innovator and Russet Burbank are sort of the basis of the New Zealand French fry industry. They're towards the end, the resistant end. But, and here's Nardine, Moonlight Red Rascal, Gladiator, these three are grown quite widely. Gladiator, again, one of the plant and food, these two are plant and food cultivars. Gladiator is now used as the world standard in experiments for susceptibility to this disease. Well, so growers can choose cultivars that are resistant to the pathogen. This sounds good, but to produce cultivars that are resistant takes a long time. Potato breeding programs are long time interval operations. The cost of new, new varieties is greater than the older varieties that don't, that don't attract uh, plant variety right uh, payments. And then there's customer requirements. I mentioned Russet Burbank. Russet Burbank was prescribed by McDonald's throughout the world as the the potato that was going to produce McDonald's uh, French fries. And so growers may not have a choice of the cultivar they, they are allowed, uh, allowed to grow by the production they're working in. I just mentioned the complexities of soil-borne diseases. I mentioned with at least two of the diseases that they cause multiple 
um, types of diseases on, on potatoes. And so to breed varieties that are resistant to all stages of the pathogen is quite difficult. There's a lot of information about the tuber disease powdery scab, as I showed in that big um, histogram, um, but the root infection stage, there's not much known about how plants, how different cultivars react to that. And then, of course, plant improvement is using new technologies, modern technologies, to supposedly shorten the plant breeding cycles, and so there's a lot of work trying to improve or shorten that long timeline for producing new cultivars. Well then, this is my last slide. What's eating all our potatoes? And I think it was pretty obvious from what I said before at the beginning that we are eating the potatoes. However, sawborn pathogens, and this is before the potatoes get to the marketplace and to the dinner table, uh, I think uh, it's fairly obvious that these organisms in the soil, which are hard to see, hard to control, are causing some of the yield gap that is operating in potato crops around the world and particularly in New Zealand. There are several things we can do, possibly, to reduce the effects of these organisms and these diseases. We can fumigate the soil or at the other end of the sustainabil sustainability spectrum we can plant resistant cultivars. The point of it all, the work that we've been doing over 25 years is really at this end of the production scale, to help the farmers grow sustainable crops that are economically returning, uh, reasonable returns to them that can maintain their operations at the level they wish. Thank you. Speaking as a home gardener, mm -hmm. I had to stop growing agrias at home, so I grew them with well-humified pine needles, mm -hmm. and I grew a successful crop last year. What, it, why, could, why couldn't you grow them? What was wrong? With the scab. They were oh, just okay. covered in scab. Okay. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe there's a pH effect. My garden's probably fairly sweet, fairly high pH. So I trenched them with well-humified pine needles last year and for the first time in many years grew a successful crop of agri with very little scab. Good. Well, it probably wasn't a pH effect. No. Um, I should say we've looked at lots of different things that might affect spongospore infection and one of them is pH and we've shown that over a broad range of pH, pHs the pathogen can in, um, infect potato roots and potato tubers. So it probably wasn't a pH effect. I don't know what else it was, but it was could have been something to do with the org organic matter, could have been something to do with the microorganisms that, that you um, stimulated in the soil, um, and it could have been a pure chemical effect. You know, pine needles have got a lot of phenolics in them, and maybe that's, that's uh, what's operating in your particular case. I don't know the answer. I don't think many farmers would use pine needles. No, no. no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> As someone from the outside looking in, how long do these things last in the soil? If you're doing crop rotation, if you, how long will they be persistent there before you came back? Is that another approach? It sure is. And I think I, I, I sort of mentioned very briefly that crop rotations. Now, with some diseases, like rhizoctonia, that works really well. They have a relatively short survival period within, in, in, the, in the soil. I would say two to three years maximum, depending on what crop has been grown, because they can infect. And the strains of rhizoctonia that infect potatoes are quite specific to potatoes. There are other strains of the same organism, same pathogen, same fungus, that attack other crops but the ones that attack potatoes are not very virulent on some other crops. So depending on the crop you grow. On the other hand, Spongospora, and I'll tell you a little anecdotal story. I was in Scotland a number of years ago and we visited a field. And this field, as far as the farmer knew, had never grown potatoes before. Um, but in the corner of his field, like literally in an area as big as what well, I'm standing here up to the back of the room, there was a very heavy infection in the rows there, very small part. 
where the hell had that come from? And it turned out that 50 years previously, in the Second World War, there was what they call a clamp. A pile of potatoes was put there, and the farmer thinks that's where the contamination came. So that pathogen had survived anecdotally, I must say, for 50 years in that soil. Obviously, there might have been a very heavy um, infest, you know, contamination. Um, we talk about 10 years for Spongospora, and some of the growers in Canterbury are operating nine to 10 years before they go back with potatoes, and they're the people that are getting the best yields. So it's a long period, but it's possible. Yeah, Richard, the difference in the water use, um, and if a farmer's trying to irrigate a paddock, um, and he's got spongospora and yeah. different levels of water use across the paddock, it's going to be particularly challenging. Um, so some of those areas are presumably going to water to the part of the paddock that needs the most water, which is then going to result in overwatering in some of those areas. Is that going to result in further increases in the incidence of yeah. not only that disease and others? And so are we contributing to our own problem with our irrigation management? On those areas. I'd say one comment in... in can, you, can you summarise the question, oh, please? Sure, sorry. Here up the, back. The, the, the question is um, water management. Um, I'll, I'll try and summarise it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Water management, is that possible? Uh, let's carry a little bit further. Is it possible for, for growers to manage the, the amount of water they put on and uh, affect the disease? i just make, a, first of all, a, a, a brief comment. In one of the crops we looked at in that first year of the surveys, the 11 crops, there were areas in the crop which were, you know, the crop was undulating, no crop stayed flat, um, and we th there was very severe spongospora in these hollows. And the suggestion was the soil was much more moist in those areas. As I mentioned, that pathogen needs soil moisture to swim in, and it's well known that moist soils encourage spongospora. Um, whether or not growers can you know, the modern irrigators, in theory, can put on different amounts of water. Uh, in potatoes, I must say, the potato crop's not very good because, you know, we make these gutters all down through the crop and if the water runs down into the hollows, um, there's a bit of work. These guys are looking at different bed form and maybe that will affect the way that water runs off potato crops. But, you know, when they're putting these big, big irrigators across, they're not being very... Uh, precise with the way the water goes on. So um, uh, the other comment I'd make that it's definitely true that if you withhold irrigation, leave the soils to be a bit drier during the tuber initiation stage, that's well before Christmas when the plants are flowering, um, there's been a strong suggestion that you get less spongospora infection in those crops than if you water at that time. But again, that's you know a time of the crop growth that water's needed, so you've got to be a bit careful with that. I, I, just another comment about watering. In Australia, where they get very high temperatures, which are considered to be above the optimum for this pathogen, they find where they irrigate, the soil temperature is actually brought down into the range that's optimum for infection. So they get very heavy infection sometimes, even when the, the air temperature is in the 30s, which um, applying water helps the pathogen. Richard, I'm interested in the possible interaction between the soil compaction, i.e. plow pan or mm -hmm. uh, subsurface pan, and the risk of the soil-borne pathogen mm -hmm. uh, being uh, more um, damaging to the plant. When we think about those subsoil compacted layers, it not only restricts the root growth of the plant, but it also causes periods of anaerobic conditions in mm -hmm. the soil at the interface between the pan and sure. the soil above it. Have you done any trials to examine whether subsoiling, i.e. ripping those pans in the same paddock as plots, has had any reduction in the risk of pathogens? I haven't. I, I ha we haven't, but uh, just it sort of follows on a little bit with mm. what we were talking about before. The compacted soils are not draining as freely. They're more likely to be I won't say waterlogged, but high moisture content. And I mean, that might have been coincidental that the five crops that were compacted also had spongospora, but it was, you know, more of a 
not only a coincidence, I'm sure. I mean, the roots were, are not growing as, as obvious, and you know, not as well. Now, whether that's because of anaerobic conditions or, or whatever, um, but also the soil moisture is probably not, uh, not uh, well, it's not draining freely, and so it stays high, and so that might be why the, the interaction is there. It, but it's well established that moist soils help Spongospora. I'm not so sure about the anaerobic. But. Richard, are these, is this going? Richard, are these pathogens antagonistic to each other? And are some pathogens useful to have around because they're not as bad as the other ones and displace them? No, I don't think they're in, I think they, they occur together. They occur on their, I mean, there are some pathogens that, that are, are antagonistic. Um, that's a well-established plant pathology principle. If you have potato plants infected with some viruses, there's a suggestion that they, for some reason, repel pathogens, and that's probably something to do with the plant's immune system being stimulated. But um, were you saying synergistic, were you? Or antagonistic. Antagonistic, OK. Well, I mean, that's a situation where there's an antagonism, but, but the, the ones that I'm talking about, there's no indication that, that, that that's happening. So they kind of partition the, what they do to the plant? Well, uh, they attack different parts of the plant, some of them. I mean, spong Spongospora goes into the roots and also into the tubers. Rhizoctonia attacks the roots as well, but very much the stems, and so they're infecting and attacking different conducting organs in the, in the plant. So are there, plant, are there plant immune responses to these? Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's well established. Almost, any, almost anything you do to a plant, if you rub the leaves, if, 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 you, um, if insects, insects feed on the leaves, and if pathogens attack the leaves, there are, and of course the roots, the, the plants respond by producing certain compounds to repel those organisms. And that's been a, a big area of research over relatively recent years to seeing whether that immune response can be mastered for disease and pest control. A long answer for a good question. Um, again, speaking as a home gardener. Garden, huh? Um, I've been growing potatoes since I was about 10 years old and always using a lot of organic matter. And I suspect there are home gardens where they've repeatedly produced good crops of potatoes. I've certainly had no bother, but I always use a, a lot of organic matter. I've always assumed that there are a lot of beneficial mm -hmm. organisms active and a very, very good soil aeration, no compaction, good aeration right right down uh, into the soil. Um, is there any significance in, in that? Yeah. Is the home garden a, an indicator of what might be? Yeah, most, most definitely. And um, <clears throat> I just was actually back to your first question. You talked about scab on your tubers, on your agrias, I think they were. So it's a pretty good chance it was powder. It's a pretty good chance it was powdery scab. but. I'm not sure of your diagnosis. Are you sure of your diagnosis of what the scab was? If it was common scab, thrives at high pHs, seven, six, um, you could have been increasing your pH and causing that particular disease. I, I think you probably hit the nail on the head. I, I used to think that what I had was a thing we used to call alternaria, for example. Mm -hmm. Does that mean about Well, it, it, it causes early blight on potatoes. It, it's a Severe foliar pathogen. Yeah, okay, no, I'm wrong then. But, but that was definitely scab because when you cleaned your potatoes, you had to really, you had to really rub. Yeah, well, well, common scab. I showed you that really, really one with deep pitted scab and and common scab. They don't well. When you get good at it, you can tell the difference between powdery scab and common scab. But um, sometimes people. So the pH could have been a factor. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Richard. Has there been any work done on the genetic basis of resistance to either tuber infection or root infection? Good question. That's Mike Dunby. He's previous uh, director of crop and food research. Um, I think, um, where's Russell? Russell here? Could you repeat the question? 
I'll repeat the question. Is there any interest in resistance to root infection? I'd say that internationally there's a hell of a lot more uh, interest in root infection than there was 25 years ago. Um, I would say largely to the work that we've been doing. Um, the plant and food resistance project program is, has been considering powdery scab on tubers for 25 or more years. I'd say it's more recent that the consideration has been given to root infection. We've been screening over the last three years a few breeding lines. I think we're through about 30 or 25 for that root infection stage and there are definite differences in the cultivars. I think I sort of showed you in one of the slides where I had those eight different cultivars. Some were reacting more to infection on the roots than others. Um, whether or not that can be harnessed by the plant breeders effectively remains to be seen. But very much the focus in plant breeding has been on the tuber powdery scab stage of that particular disease. Question. Uh, Richard, when you were talking about things that growers can do from pre-planting right through yes. and some cultural right through to chemical, what, how much is known about what disease is in the actual seed potatoes they're planting? Because obviously the easiest way to not have disease is you don't want to be bringing it mm -hmm. into the paddock. Good, good question, Anna. Um, uh, just another little anecdote. Um, powdery, scab, powdery scab, that particular disease, came onto the scene in the mid, early early to mid 1990s, maybe late 1980s, sort of coincided with the phasing out of mercury, bleh, mercury seed tuber treatments on potatoes. And of course, they've never been used since. They're completely banned throughout the world. Now, was that a coincidence or not? Um, there was also, I guess, increased intensity of potato production, there was growing of more, maybe more susceptible cultivars, that definitely occurred in places like the Netherlands for example, the cultivars changed and they were more susceptible. So there were other factors but I would say seed tuber health, particularly as far as Spongospora is concerned, now if you see tubers like those ones, it's very obvious that they've got disease but if those sorts of tubers have been in a seed lot with healthy tubers and then being graded out, and that's what they were doing in Scotland. They had some crops that were, they were grading out 90% of the tubers because they had Spongospora infections on them. So they were left with not much, many seed tubers, but they were completely contaminated. They looked healthy, but they had those sporosaurae, those structures that I showed you with the electron micrographs. They, of course, were contaminating the, the seed tubers and if they weren't treated and planted they would be heavily infected or possibly heavily infected. So seed tuber health is very important and all, almost all countries have standards for how much infection they allow um, on their seed potatoes but I would say really the only real way to go is to have no infection on the tubers but also treat them with something that um, um, kills the the resting spores that are surviving. But just not mercury. Sorry? But not mercury. No, no, not mercury, no. Mm -hmm. one, one last question from the audience. Yes, why do you? Richard, how effective is uh, the fusel treatment and how long does it last? Well, it's very effective. Yeah. Um, another anecdote, I guess. Um, in Western Australia, south of Perth, they grow potatoes on a two-year rotation on, well, it, it, it's white sand. It's sort of almost like a seaside sand, and they put huge amounts of nutrients on it. It's, it's, it's almost hydroponics, but it's in field crops. And they use um, soil fumigants, and they grow onions and potatoes, onions and potatoes, onions and potatoes, onions and potatoes. That should be a no-no, but they use soil fumigants and get very good crops. So it's, it's very effective uh, and works for that crop and then they do it a second year and a second year and a second year. Do you anticipate the soil in New Zealand? I think it's too expensive. Okay, and as Chair I'll reserve the right to ask the last question of tonight. Richard, you haven't mentioned possibilities for biocontrol of either of these pathogens, could you, what's happening there? 
uh, a little bit. Um, well, it depends how broad you take biocontrol. Traditional biocontrol using organisms that are antagonistic to the pathogen. Um, there's been some work done in the Bioprotection Centre. That's why you asked the question. Um, and I must say, it, it suggests, and, and not only there, uh, international research, a small amount of international research using trichodermis, seeing whether trichodermis could reduce the um, amount of spongospora infection of both roots and tubers, and I'd say they don't work. As far as the isolates that have been tested uh, and um, yeah, haven't been able to reduce uh, disease. Uh, with Rhizoctonia, Damien Vinkowski, you remember, um, did a large PhD project that showed that trichodermis and other organisms, I think he had some bacteria, could reduce uh, Rhizoctonia in glasshouse situations, getting a sort of a 60% reduction in, in the amount of disease, but that wasn't big enough to take to a commercial product. That, that reduction in disease didn't anywhere achieve what the traditional fungicides do. And so that investigation uh, didn't go into a, a practical outcome. So in, at least in those two diseases that I'm, there's been lots of sort of attempts, particularly in Rhizoctonia, but uh, not much success. Okay, thanks Richard. So I'd like you now to join with me in thanking Richard for his presentation to us tonight. Thank you.